Louis Stantl made a great deal of money during the Depression because he dealt in solaces. When a man is down on his luck, he seems to consume all he can get of coffee and donuts. The sugar in the coffee was boys' sugar, and the donuts were boys' donuts. When a woman without the money to give her children a decent meal must give them something to stop their crying, she probably gives them a soft drink. It was boys' soft drink behind tons of cheap confectionery sweets, snacks, nibbles, and simple cooking sugar stood Boy Staunton, though not many people knew it. He was the president and managing director of Alpha Corporation, a much respected company that made nothing itself but controlled all the other companies that did. He first went into the bread business because a large company was in difficulties and could be bought at rock bottom price. Why not try beer as well, boy? I may do that when the economy is steadier, but at present, I feel I should do everything I can to see that people have necessities. Uh, can I freshen your drink? Mm. And you can get me a pink gin while you're at it. Hello, Dunny. Supper will be ready in a few minutes. Dinner, Leo. Supper is what you have after the theater. Oh, for heaven's sake, boy. It's just Dunny. And if you have to use hick expressions, you might at least say, for heaven's sake. Well, for heaven's sake. I don't see why you want me to sound so stuck up. I never talked that way before, did I? It's not stuck up. You're not in depth right now. You're moving in entirely different circles. You have a responsibility. Well, sometimes I get tired of responsibility. Moral energy, Leo. Oh. Did you know Kuei's book, Dunny? Success through auto-suggestion? That's it. I've got Leola working on it. He has, really. Every night before I go to sleep, I have to say over and over again, every day, in, in every, every way, way, I'm getting better and better, right? <laughs> Well, it, it doesn't seem to be doing much good. <laughs> well, um, I'm going to go and check on dinner. You're just not trying, Leo. you simply got to try harder. Perhaps he's trying too hard. Oh, don't be absurd, Dunny. There's no such thing as trying too hard, whatever you're doing. Yes, there is. Have you never heard of the law of reversed effort? The harder you try, the more likely you are to miss the mark. Never heard such nonsense. Who says that? Mm, a lot of wise people have said it. And the latest is your Dr. Kue. Don't clench your teeth and push for success, he says, or everything will work against you. Psychological fact. Bunk. He doesn't say it in my book. <laughs> but, boy, you never study anything properly. That miserable little pamphlet you have just gives you a farcical smattering of Kueism. You should read Baudouin's suggestion and auto-suggestion and get things right. How many pages? I don't count pages. It's a good-sized book. I haven't got time for big books. I have to have the heart of things. If effort is all wrong, why does Kuwe work for me? I put lots of effort into it. I don't suppose it does work for you. You don't need it. Every day in every way, you do get better and better in whatever sense you understand the word better, because that's the kind of person you are. You've got ingrained success. Okay, everybody. All's well. Say, why don't you bring your book over and explain it to Leola? Make her read it. You help her understand it. What? You two seem to understand each other so well. <laughs> I sometimes wonder if I should have taken Leola away from you, Dunny. Say, I don't think you've seen my last batch of photographs, Dunny. If they're of the royal tour, I have indeed. Oh, no, these aren't pictures of the prince, old boy. These are pictures of a princess. Oh, don't show those. Oh, why not? Oh, because... Come on, Dunny will love them. He's never seen pictures of a prettier girl. Boy, please, please put them away. I'll, I'll go upstairs, I promise. I, no, I don't want Dunny to see them while I'm here. Leo, I never thought you were such a little prude. Boy... Look, it is nice. Nice, nice. Of course it isn't nice. Only fools worry about what's nice. Now, you sit right down here by me. And, Dunny, you on the other side. Be proud of what a stunner you are. Oh, come on. Now, there you are, Dunny. Isn't that a beauty? I mean, <laughs> the bearskin rug, of course. Boy, please. <laughs> and look, I used a soft focus on this. Don't you love what it does to the nipples? Boy, I'm leaving. Don't be silly, my dear. Margot Asquith receives callers in her bath. It's right that you should know how beautiful you are. Isn't that right, Denny? What, cat got your tongue, old man? Hope you're not finding it too hot in here. I'm quite comfortable, thank you. <laughs> I just thought you might find the situation a bit unusual, as Leola does. Unusual, but uh, not unprecedented. Call it historical, even mythological. How's that? It's happened before, you know. Why? Do you remember the story of Gyges and King Candolus? Never heard of him. I thought not. Well, 
Scandalus was a king of Lydia a long time ago, and he was so proud of his wife's beauty that he insisted his friend Gyges should see her naked. Generous chap. What happened? Uh, there are two versions. One is that the queen took a fancy to Gyges, and together they pushed Candolus off his throne. <laughs> really? Well, there's not much chance of that here, is there? You'd find my throne a bit too big, Dunny. The other is that Guy just killed Candolus. <laughs> I don't suppose you'll do that either, Dunny. Every fortnight during the school term, I made the journey to Weston on Saturday morning and had lunch with Miss Bertha Shanklin and Mrs. Dempster. At these meals, Mrs. Dempster rarely spoke, and although it was clear she recognized me as a regular visitor, nothing to suggest any memory of Deptford ever passed between us. I played fair with Miss Shanklin and appeared in the guise of a new friend. I was faithful in these visits until February 1932, when Miss Shanklin took pneumonia and died. I did not know of it until I received a letter from her lawyer bidding me to the funeral and adding that we must have a talk afterward. It's as simple as this. Your name is Miss Shanklin's executor. Everything goes to Mary Dempster, except some small legacies. You are to have 5,000 a year, on condition that you get yourself appointed uh, Mary Dempster's guardian and undertake to look after her and administer her money for her as long as she lives. The catch is this. All of Miss Shanklin's investments have done badly in the crash and the depression. I doubt that the entire estate will be worth more than $5,000 after the house is sold. You in due time, I was appointed the legal guardian of Mary Dempster and began to maintain her. But what was I to do with her? I investigated the matter of private hospitals and found that to keep her in one would beggar me. I was not too badly off for a single man, but I had no funds to maintain an expensive invalid. So much against my will, I got Mrs. Dempster into a public hospital for the insane in Toronto where I could keep an eye on her. It was a dark day for both of us when I took her there. This drawer will be for your things. Uh, there's a rule, though, that nothing must be left on top. Uh, we'll try to find you three or four hangers in the closet. Uh, but then you won't be needing coats or anything kept in there, will you? She had a bed in one of the long wards, and I left her standing beside it. Cher Monsieur Ramsay, your notes on the Vilgefortis Comernus figure have been read with interest by some of us here, and we seek your consent to its publication in the next Analecta. Will you be so good as to write... Few things in life have given me so much delight as this letter. To be published in the Analecta Bolandiana was an honor almost without equal to me. The Bollandists are a group of Jesuits whose special task is to record all available information about saints and their publications are of the greatest importance and interest, historically as well as hagiographically. My next saint-hunting expedition led me directly to Brussels, where they at once gave me the run of their magnificent library. More than 150,000 books about saints. It seemed a paradise. It was in the library that I met Padre Ignazio Blazon. We shall dine together, yes? Yes, I would like that. Ha-ha, <laughs> fine. I am one of nature's guests, Monsieur Ramsey. And if you will take care of the bill, I shall be happy to recompense you with information about the saints you will certainly not find in our library. <laughs> if, on the contrary, you insist that I should take my turn as host, I shall expect you to divert me. And I am not an easy man to amuse, Mr. Ramsey. As a host, I am exigent, rebarbative, and accommodating. As a guest, ho, oh, oh, ho, oh, quite another set of false teeth, I assure you. <laughs> uh, you Protestants, if you think of saints at all, regard them with quite the wrong sort of veneration. I think you must be deceived by our cheap religious statuary. All those pink and blue dolls, you know, are for people who think they're beautiful. <laughs> 
Saint Joseph now. What is his fear of patronage, Ramsey? Oh, carpenters, mm -hmm. dying. Uh -huh. The family, uh -huh. married couples, and uh, people looking for houses. Yes, and the Naples of confectioners. Don't ask me why. But what else? Come on, now. Put your mind to it. What made Joseph famous? The earthly father of Christ. <laughs> oh, you nice Protestant boy. Joseph is history's most celebrated cockle. Well, did not God usurp Joseph's function? And is not Joseph known as Tio Peppy, Uncle Joe, and invoked by husbands who are getting worried, eh? Ah, St. Joseph hears more prayers about cockledry than he does about house hunting or confectionery, I can assure you. Indeed, in the underworld hagiology of which I promise to tell you, it is whispered that the Virgin herself, who was born through God's personal intervention, was a divine daughter, as well as a divine maid. Hey, the Greeks could hardly improve on that now, could they? And do you know the scandal that makes it necessary to keep apart the statues of Mary and those of St. John? Uh, please, monsieur. What? Uh, Padre Blazon. Huh? We are going to be thrown out of this restaurant if you don't lower your voice. It was with this learned chatterbox that I set out to travel from Brussels to Vienna. When I arrived at the station, I found him already in sole possession of a carriage. Paternoster, and Chairman, Sanctuary. Ah, it's you, Ra Ramsey. Ramsey, give me a hand with the Paternoster. Held Vinyeth, like no tomb. Feared voluntas to a sicker than jail in terror. Why are we doing this? Excuse me, Sume, est-ce que ce compartiment est occupé? Eh, de mid nobis, de vita nostra, sein in nos indocus in tentationum. Said we will have no zamello. Amen. Amen. Ah, we begin. You will notice we have the carriage to ourselves. Strange how reluctant travelers are to join in devotions that might, uh, who can say, avert some terrible accident. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you brought the refreshment basket, eh? <clears throat> it might be provident to take some of that brandy immediately. Eh? I know this journey, and sometimes emotional train can be very distressing, and so... Um... <sighs> You were going to think over what I told you about. Oh, I had not forgotten your questions about the woman you keep in the madhouse, Ramsey. It's not been absent from my mind, you may be assured. Why do you worry? What good would it do you if I told you she is indeed a saint? If you think you're a saint, she's a saint to you. What more do you ask? That's what we call the reality of the soul. You are foolish to demand the agreement of the world as well. But the miracles... Have you considered the miracles? Ah, miracles, they happen everywhere. They are conditional. If I take a photograph of you, Ramsey, it's a compliment and perhaps rather a bore. But if I go into the jungle and take a photograph of a primitive, he probably thinks it's a miracle. Miracles are simply things people cannot explain. Look at me, Ramsey. I am something of a miracle myself. My parents had seven daughters. Think of it, Ramsey. Seven. My poor mother was beside herself at the disgrace. So she vowed solemnly in church that if she might bear a son, she would give him to the service of God. Within a year, whoop, behold, little Ignacio. Ah, to a geneticist, I suppose, it's not breathtaking that after seven daughters, a woman should have a son. But to my mother, it was a miracle. The neighbors said, you know how the neighbors always say, wait, the trouble's to come, it'll be a wild one, this Ignacio, the jail gapes for these sanctified children, was it so? <laughs> no, not a bit. I seem to be a Jesuit from the womb. Studious, obedient, intelligent, and chaste. Behold me, Ramsey, a virgin at the age of 76. Of how many can that be said, huh? Girls laid themselves out to tempt me. They were incited to seduce me by my sisters, who had only ordinary chastity and thought mine distasteful. Well, I will not say I was not flattered by these temptations. But always I would say, God did not give us this jewel of chastity to be trampled in the dirt, my dear Dolores and Maria, or whoever it was. 
pray for an honorable and loving marriage and put me from your mind. Oh, oh, oh how they hated that. Eh? One girl hit me with a big stone. You see the mark here still? Eh? Just where my hair used to begin. This was a real miracle. For every morning, I had unmistakable assurance that I could have been a great lover. <laughs> you understand me? But I love my vocation more. Please, Padre. Oh, uh, I have not forgotten your crazy thing. I think you're a fool to fret that she was knocked on the head because of an act of yours. Perhaps that's what she was for, Ramsey. She saved you on the battlefield, you say. But did she not also save you when she took the blow that was meant for you? Are you suggesting, then, that I have no responsibility to her? Oh, no, 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 no! If she has no friend but you, care for her, by all means. But stop trying to be God and make it up to her that you are saying that she is mad. Turn your mind to the real problem. Who is she? What figure is she in your personal mythology? If she appeared to save you on the battlefield, as you say, it has just as much to do with you as it has with her. Much more, probably. Lots of men have visions of their mothers in time of danger. Why not you? Why was it this woman? Who is she? That is what you must discover, Ramsey. And you must find your answer in psychological truth. Not in objective truth. You will not find out quickly, I'm sure. And while you are searching, get on with your own life and accept the possibility that it may be purchased at the price of hers. And that this may be God's plan for you and her. Forgive yourself for being a human creature, Ramsey. That's the beginning of wisdom. That is part of what is meant by the fear of God. And for you, it's the only way to save your sanity. Begin now, or you'll end up with your saint in the madhouse. <laughs> oh, come on, dog. My visits to Mrs. Dempster weighed on me. The occasional lightning of the spirit that had shown itself when she lived with Bertha Shankler never came now. She was always waiting for me on Saturday afternoon with her hat on. I knew what the hat meant. She hoped that this time I would take her away. This rubbed deeply into me the knowledge that though reason may be injured, feeling lives intensely in the insane. It was as though I were visiting a part of my own soul that was condemned to live in hell. But you must believe me when I tell you... 1936 was an emotionally exhausting year for boy Staunton. ...to carry the heavy burden of responsibility and to discharge my duties as king as I would wish to do without the help and support of the woman I oh, love. God, they've made him do it. And now... The old men have made him do it. They all have the They don't understand. How could those stupid old I fools understand? How could they know about love? With people. I'm very sorry for you. And prosperity. Oh, God, darling. With all my heart. Oh, God. God bless you all. And I'm very sorry for you, boy. God save the king. Christmas was a dark day for the Stauntons. Charlie's arm came off. Put it back, Daddy. I want you to put it back. Not now, Caroline. Play with one of your other presents. No, I want my doll. I want my doll. Then take it to your mother. She bought the stupid thing for Mommy. you. Oh, boy, please. Look, Caroline, Mommy's busy just now, dear. Play with Davy for a while. Davy, go on. Show Caroline how to play with one of your new games. Mom, I'm reading. Oh. Come on, play with my doll. Caroline. Play my doll. God, Leola, can't you take better care of your children? Doll. You give Caroline a doll, it breaks as soon as it's unwrapped. Oh, boy, I can't do everything my myself. For heaven's sake. You, you didn't help at all with the kiss. Doll. All you do is, is criticize. Doll. Caroline, Caroline, let's see if Uncle Dunny can fix your doll. Here. 
That's it, Ruth. That's it. Perhaps we can make a bandage with this handkerchief. Danny, if you insist on behaving like one of those saints you're always yapping about, I really wish you'd do it somewhere else. And I wish you'd learn to take your abdication like a man. I'm going for a walk. I can't stand this. That's a good idea, dear. A, a walk will relax you, make you feel better. Hmm? Here, I I'll get your coat for you. Can I come with you? No, David. Your father wants to go alone. Well, aren't you going to open your presents first? No, your father doesn't feel like opening presents at the moment. Your father has a headache. And give me that book, Davy. I don't want you to read that damn book. Look at this. Fairy tales. That's a girl's book, not a boy's book. Will you look at this, Dunny? I don't know where Leola gets her ideas. Last year it was a doll, for the love of God. I had to take it from it a It wasn't a doll. It was a soldier. A Highland soldier. It was a doll. It was dressed in a skirt. She let the boy take it to bed with him. The step in, of course. Take it away. Where's my coat? I've got to get out of here. Here's your coat. What's the matter with you now? I checked to see that your gloves were in the pocket. And I found this note. I see. And you read it, of course. Yeah, I read it. Well, it shouldn't be too much of a surprise to you, should it? Surely it occurred to you I was seeing someone. A man like me needs a woman, not just some thing that lies there. <laughs> There's no reason to carry on like that. Your situation is perfectly secure. But if you think I intend to be tied down to this sort of domestic bedlam, you can think again. Why don't you go up to your room, my dear? Yes. I'll settle the children. Yes. And I'll, I'll be up to see you in a few minutes, okay? It's all right. How are you feeling now, my dear? Much better. Hey, come and sit on the bed beside me. The children are settled in the nursery. David is reading, and Caroline is happily playing nurse to her sick doll. Thank you, Danny. You're about to have a nap, I see. Mm -hmm. Very sensible. You'll feel much better, I'm sure. Things will fall into perspective after you've rested. Things have fallen into perspective already. Good, good, excellent. You see, nothing's ever quite as bad as it looks. Well, then, I'm afraid I have another Christmas dinner to eat. Will you be all right if I go now? Dunny, kiss me. Of course. No, not like that. <laughs> Remember, you used to like to kiss me. <laughs> hmm? Goodbye, my dear. No, no, that's no good. Please, go and kiss, kiss me, really. Really. Oh. <laughs> no. Danny? No. You must sleep now. I'll, uh, I'll look in later tonight, and we'll talk with Boy. You don't, you don't love me. You don't love me. You don't love me either. Goodbye, Leola. I'll be back this evening. I returned to the Staunton's home later that evening to find the children's nurse in a panic. God, you've come, sir. I, I've been telephoning all over. I didn't know what to do. What is it, Nettie? I came back from Christmas Day off and found the housemaid, the butler, the cook still out. The children were alone in the nursery. They're all right? Oh, yes, uh, they're all right. So I looked in on Mrs. Staunton to say good night. Yes? She wasn't in her room, but the bathroom light was on and the door was slightly open. So I looked in. Yes, Nettie? Well, look at this. Dear God. I've never seen so much blood in my life. Where is she? Is she all right? Well, she's all right, I think. I, I got her out of the tub and bandaged her wrists and got her to bed. Did you call the doctor? Well, of course I called the doctor. But it's Christmas night. It's been more than an hour. He still hasn't come. I tried to phone you, too, because, well, this note was on the dresser. A note for me? Dearest Dunny, this is the end. 
boy does not love me, and you don't either. So it's best for me to go. Think of me sometimes. I always loved you. Love Viola. Fool. 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 No note for boy, no. Just a note for me. Which would have made me look like a monster if she hadn't made a mess of this or so much else. Boy couldn't be found. His business address in Montreal knew nothing of him. And he didn't return until after New Year's Day, by which time Leola was on the mend, though feeble. What passed between them, I do not know. and was never told. But from that time onward, they seemed to rub along without open disagreement. So Leola faded rapidly and looked more than her years. Indeed, the pretty face that had once ensnared both boy and me became pudgy and empty. Leola had joined the great company of the walking wounded in the battle of life. World War II brought a further increase in stature to boy Staunton. Who but he was the obvious candidate for the post of Minister of Food in a coalition cabinet. Of course, he had to spend most of his time in Ottawa, so he saw little of Leola or his children during the war years. When Leola fell ill of pneumonia, I informed Boy and did all the obvious things and didn't worry. But during her convalescence, she opened her windows one afternoon when the nurse had closed them and took a chill. She was dead in less than a week. Boy was in England and duty kept him there. So I arranged the funeral, which was easy, and told the people who had to be told which was not. Poor Mum. I guess she's better off, really. For as much as it hath pleased Almighty God of his great mercy to receive unto himself the soul of our dear sister here departed... It was one of those wretched late autumn funerals. Earth to earth, Everything was wet and miserable. Dust to dust, there were not many present. But there were mountains of costly flowers looking particularly foolish under a November sky. One unexpected figure was at the graveside. Older, fatter, and unwontedly quiet though he was, I knew Milo Papel in an instant. Poor Leola. It's the end of a great romance. You know... We always thought her and Purse were the handsomest pair that ever got married in Deptford. I know why you never got married. Must be tough on you to see her go, Dunny. 